Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Career Discovery presentation on the FAFSA, answering parent and student questions with Bank of North Dakota and mapping your future. I'm Amanda Waidula, University and Student Development Coordinator at the Bank of North Dakota, and I will be facilitating tonight's webinar. During tonight's session, students and parents will learn about the 2021 22, that's a lot of 20s, FAFSA to apply for federal financial aid, what's new at the FAFSA, and answering your questions about filling out the form and financial aid. Some housekeeping items in the menu of the webinar, there is both a chat and Q&A function that we will encourage all of you to use um, for the questions or comments that you have about tonight's webinar on the FAFSA. Um, we will answer questions at two points throughout the webinar. So we'll stop in the middle and then we'll also answer them at the end. But please put them in the Q&A box when you have them and we'll address them at those two points. Tonight's presenter is Kathy Mueller, Executive Director from Math Mapping Your Future. Kathy is based out of Texas and has previously worked in higher education, communications, journalism, and public relations. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware and a master's degree from the University of North Texas and is often included as a source for articles on issues in higher education and financial aid. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Amanda. It's my pleasure to be here this evening, and I'm going to turn off my webcam so we can focus on the slides tonight. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit first about Mapping Your Future. Mapping Your Future is a public service, nonprofit organization. You can find more information and free resources online at mappingyourfuture.org. We work with a number of organizations and states throughout the country including there in North Dakota. Our agenda tonight is to talk about the free application for federal student aid, and we'll spend uh, most of that time tonight on that subject, although we will talk a little bit more about financial aid in general. Also, I'll provide some resources for additional assistance after tonight's presentation. I wanted to talk a little bit about paying for education first and where most parents and students uh, get funding for education. And of course, one of those sources is savings. That's any savings that either the student or the parent has for their college education. Any current cash or earnings, and what we mean by that is if the student has a part-time job, they can use any current earnings to help pay for their education. Also, parents often use current salary to help pay for an education. I do myself. Uh, I have a daughter in college right now, and I'm using some of my current earnings to help pay for her education. Of course, there's financial aid, and that's where we're gonna spend most of the discussion this evening. But I do wanna mention tax credits and deductions. Now, tax credits and deductions don't necessarily help you pay for an education, but they do help offset the cost of an education. And so I mentioned tax credits and deductions here as a reminder to make sure that you take advantage, advantage of those tax credits and deductions when you file your tax return. So in looking at the financial aid process at a high level, there are basically four steps. The student will complete the free application for federal student aid. A few days later, they will receive a student aid report. And that student aid report basically will have information that they provided on the FAFSA and an estimated family contribution. And we'll talk more about the student aid report later in the presentation. They'll also receive award letters or financial aid offers from the schools that they list on the FAFSA. Usually that comes in the spring. And I call them either award letters or financial aid offers because you'll see both terms used. Uh, and uh, so just know that whether it's an award letter or a financial aid office offer, it's basically the same thing. The student will carefully review those award letters or financial aid offers and decide which aid to accept and then they'll return that award letter to the school that they plan to attend. There are basically four types of financial aid. 
grants, scholarships, work study programs, loans, and those types of financial aid fall into two different categories, either need-based, meaning that the student has to have a demonstrated financial need for that financial aid, or non-need-based. And that could mean that the student is eligible, um, just everyone is eligible for that type of financial aid, or uh, it could be based on academics or other activities. Now, I want to talk about each type of funding. First of all, grants and scholarships. Grants and scholarships are the best type of financial aid, and that's because it's typically called gift aid, meaning students usually do not have to repay grants and scholarships. Also, grants and scholarships can be either need-based or non-need-based. I mentioned that typically students don't have to repay grants and scholarships, but I do want to caution you to be very careful because there are some grants and scholarships that do come with requirements. And if a student fails to meet those requirements, they could lose the grant or scholarship, or the grant or scholarship could turn into a loan, which they have to repay. Work study programs are federal programs, and they are need-based, meaning that you do have to have a demonstrated financial need in order to receive work study. We'll talk a little bit more about work study when we're completing the FAFSA. And finally, there are loans, and loans can be either federal loans, many states have state loan programs, and then also there are private loans offered by private banks or credit unions. So what is the FAFSA? The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, and note I said that word free. That means that you should never pay to complete the FAFSA. In addition, you really should never pay for any help to complete the FAFSA. There are a lot of resources out there, like Mapping Your Future, that provide free help in completing the FAFSA. It's the base application for various forms of financial aid, uh, both need-based and non-need-based. and um, as you see here on the screen, there are many organizations that use the FAFSA to determine eligibility for financial aid. The federal government, many states require the FAFSA for their state financial aid programs. Many colleges and universities and schools require the FAFSA for their institutional aid programs. And finally, there are private foundations that require the FAFSA for their scholarship programs. It's really important that a student complete the FAFSA because so many organizations require it. I often hear a student say, well, I'm not gonna complete the FAFSA because I won't qualify for a need-based aid and I don't want student loans. However, as you can see, there are many other organizations that require the FAFSA, and it may be for scholarships. And so it's really important that a student complete the FAFSA and keep their options open. The FAFSA became available on October 1st, last week, for the 2021-22 academic year. I do uh, stress too that students should complete the FAFSA as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that there are some particularly institutional financial aid programs that are on a first come first serve basis. And so it's important that a student get their FAFSA in as early as possible. And while they do have some time to fill out the FAFSA to qualify for federal financial aid, it's important that students watch any state deadlines for the FAFSA to be completed. And also many colleges and universities and schools have deadlines. They often call those priority deadlines. To complete the FAFSA, the student will go to fafsa.gov. 
or they can go to studentaid.gov. It basically takes them to the same website. In fact, if you enter fafsa.gov in your browser, you may notice that the address at the top changes to studentaid.gov. That's okay. That's uh, part of the Department of Education's plans. But it's very important that the student remember that the address should have .gov. This is the location where the student will start their 21-22 FAFSA. It's also where they will submit a renewal FAFSA next year. So just a reminder that the student has to go in every year they're pursuing post-secondary education and update their information by submitting a renewal FAFSA. They'll view their student aid report at this location. They can make any corrections and provide any missing signatures at this location. A couple of years ago, the Department of Education released a My Student Aid mobile app. And basically, a student can download the app from the Apple Store or Google Play, and they can complete their FAFSA on a cell phone or a tablet. The app is very secure, uh, but I do want to encourage students to make sure they are on a secure Wi-Fi if they're using the My Student Aid mobile app to complete the FAFSA because you are entering personal information. And so you want to make sure that Wi-Fi you're using is password protected. I also want to mention that right now, the 21-22 FAFSA is not on the app. However, if you go to the app, it will take you to a browser uh, to complete the FAFSA on the web. One of the ways to get prepared for completing the FAFSA is to use the FAFSA on the web worksheet. We note the address of the worksheet here on the screen. It We'll have questions on it, some which you may not see on your FAFSA. That's because there's some skip logic in the FAFSA, and so you don't always see every question. So you can use this worksheet to get an idea of the kinds of questions that you might see and know what kind of documents you're going to have to have as you complete the FAFSA. Just remember, that this worksheet is for your purposes only and should not be submitted anywhere. So we've broken down completing the FAFSA into 10 steps, and that may seem like a lot, but it actually goes fairly quickly. And so we're going to go through each one of these steps. The first step is to create an FSA ID. The student and one parent, at least one parent, will need an FSA ID. And so the student and parent will go to fsaid.ed.gov. They will enter an email address. Now, I want to mention here that the student should not use an email address associated with their high school because you're going to need access to that email after you graduate high school. So it's important to use an email that you're going to have access to basically uh, for quite some time because this will be your FSA ID permanently. The same for parents. Uh, parents should use a non-work email address because if you change jobs, you won't have access to that email. You'll create your username and password and then you're gonna enter some personal information that personal information will match up to the Social Security Administration, but it will also be information that they'll use to help you retrieve your FSA ID should you ever lose it or forget it. You'll submit your information, and then you can go ahead and complete the FAFSA right away, but you will receive an email a few days later letting you know that you have created an FSA ID. The student and parent will use the FSA ID to perform several uh, processes related to financial aid, 
And that includes for the student, they'll use it to sign into the FAFSA, to retrieve any tax information if applicable, to sign the FAFSA. If the student decides they want any direct student loans, they'll need that FSA ID to apply for those loans. And then in the future, the student will use that FSA ID to access their aid history on the National Student Loan Data System, which is also accessible at the website studentaid.gov. The parent will use the FSA ID again to retrieve any tax information and to sign the FAFSA. And then if the parent decides to take out a direct plus parent loan uh, for the student, they'll need that FSA ID to apply. We list out the documents that you're going to need to complete the FAFSA here on the screen, uh, but we're going to talk about each one of these documents as we go through completing the FAFSA. I just want to point out here, make sure that you have your 2019 federal tax information for the 21-22 FAFSA. So the student will log in. They'll use their FSA ID, username, and password to log into the FAFSA. And then they're going to select the appropriate FAFSA to complete. Now, I do want to mention here that for a while, there will be two FAFSAs out there. If a student is a high school senior planning to attend post-secondary education next fall, they're going to want to choose the 21-22 FAFSA. The first section of the FAFSA is the student demographic section. And I want to point out here in the upper left-hand corner, you see that the tab is on student demographics. One of the nice things about the FAFSA is the student can see their progress. That tab moves along as the student completes different sections of the FAFSA. Also, I want to point out that the FAFSA does save as the student completes different sections. Uh, so you can stop at any time and come back in to complete the FAFSA. Also, you can create a, sa a save key at the very beginning that'll allow a parent to come in and complete their portion of the FAFSA. On the student demographics section, I wanna point out a few things. First of all, name and social security number. It's very important that this information match exactly what the student has on their social security card. As I mentioned, they will be matching this information up to the Social Security Administration. And in particular, the social security number is a piece of information that the student cannot go back in and correct. So if the student has their social security number wrong, it could delay their financial aid, or they could have to start all over on the FAFSA. So it's critical that the student get that correct. Also note the driver's license. If a student does not have a driver's license, they can just leave that field blank. Also, the student will be asked about residency and citizenship. Those questions are to determine eligibility for financial aid. Also in the student demographics section, the student will be asked about their high school completion status once they plan to uh, enter into post-secondary education next fall. And so for most high school students, they're going to select high school diploma. It will also ask about your degree or certificate plans. Now, you are not committed to anything here, but just enter what you intend. Uh, it does give the schools that you list on the FAFSA an idea of what your plans are, but uh, you can always change those plans later. I want to point out the federal work study question. As you remember, we uh, mentioned that federal work study is a need-based program. So you do have to have need to be awarded federal work study. However, I encourage all students to go ahead and say yes 
to this question. First of all, if you are awarded federal work study and you qualify for it, uh, but you decide you don't want it, you can always turn it down. If you answer this question yes and you're not qualified for federal work study, you just won't be offered it. So it's not going to hurt to go ahead and say yes to this question and it keeps your options open. If a student is male, they will be asked about registering for the selective service. It is a requirement of federal financial aid that all male students be registered with the selective service by the time they are 18. If a student is 18 and they have not registered with the selective service, they can choose to have the FAFSA register them for the selective service. The student will also be asked about foster care and parent education completion. Now these two questions are also questions to determine eligibility for financial aid, but also the question about parent education completion. And let me mention here too that this is uh, about the student's biological parents. This question may also be used for Department of Education research purposes at an aggregate level to determine the numbers of first generation college students. In addition, the student will be asked about their high school. And here, this is very easy to complete. The student will start to enter their high school name and actually the information about their high school will likely pop up and they can just select the appropriate school and the form will be completed. So it's a very easy section of the FAFSA to complete. Now this is my favorite part of the FAFSA. It's where the students will select the colleges and universities and schools that they want to receive their FAFSA information. A student can provide up to 10 schools on the FAFSA. And uh, this also is database driven. So a student will start to enter their, the name of the school they're interested in attending. And then uh, the name of the school will pop up and they can select it and uh, the fields will be populated. Also, another question on this screen is about the housing plans. So the student will be asked, do they plan to live on campus in a dormitory, off campus in an apartment, or off campus at home with their parents? The reason this question is asked is the schools that the student listed on the FAFSA will use that information to determine the cost of attendance for that student. And we'll talk a little bit more about cost of attendance later in the presentation. So on the screen, you see some very important terms that are part of the FAFSA. And we're gonna talk about all of those terms uh, as we go through the parent section of the FAFSA here in just a moment. But I'm gonna pause right now and see if there are any questions. All right, there are no questions at this time. Now, everybody, if you'd like to have any questions answered, you can place them in the questions box on the menu. Um, but seeing no questions, uh, we will move on and answer any that come in at the end. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. And so we're gonna go on and uh, talk about each one of those terms. The first term that we wanna examine is dependency status. And you saw uh, dependent versus independent. The FAFSA will try to determine is a student a dependent student or an independent student. And what we mean by that is dependent students have to provide financial information about their parents. 
independent students do not. I want to mention here too that most high school students are considered dependent students and do have to provide parental financial information. However, there are sometimes exceptions. And so if a student can answer yes to any of those questions you see on the screen, uh, they will be considered independent and will not need to provide parental financial information. I did want to point out one of those definitions of unaccompanied homeless youth. If a student is uh, considered an unaccompanied homeless youth, they are considered independent, but they will need to fit into all three of those definitions. That is not in the physical custody of a parent, lacking fixed, regular, and adequate housing, and 23 years of age or younger. And in addition, this will need to be certified either by a school district official, a college or university official, or a social service agency. In some cases, a student may be dependent, but for whatever reason, they cannot provide parental financial information. So the FAFSA does give the student an option to indicate they cannot provide parental financial information. However, the schools that the student listed on the FAFSA will be notified and they will be required to reach out to the student to determine why they could not provide parental financial information. So who is the parent for FAFSA purposes? The parent is the biological or adoptive parents of the student, and they must be considered the student's legal parents. Now, sometimes students will live with grandparents or foster parents, older siblings or uh, legal guardians. Those are not the student's parents unless they have legally adopted the student. One example I have is I had a grandparent who was completing the FAFSA for his grandson who lived with him. He brought in his financial information. However, we could not use the grandparent's uh, financial information on the FAFSA because the grandparent had not legally adopted the grandson. We could not reach the parents in that situation so, as you saw on the previous screen, we indicated that we could not provide parental information. So, it's important that students understand which parental information to provide and based on the various situations. And so, we have a list here for you on the screen. If the student's parents are married, the student will provide financial information for both parents. If the student's parents are unmarried but living together, again, the student will provide information for both parents. In situations where the student's parents are divorced or they were never married and they're not living together, the student will provide information for the parent which they lived with the most. Now we know there are joint custody situations and so a student may live half time with one parent and half time with another parent. In those situations, the student should provide information for the parent that provided the most financial support. It can be challenging in joint custody situations to determine which parent provided the most financial support uh, but if you look closely, perhaps one parent provided uh, insurance or another parent provided transportation. So the Department of Education wants you to determine which parent provided the most financial support and the student should provide that parent's financial information on the FAFSA. If the student's parent is remarried and the student is living with the parent and the step-parent, 
the student will need to provide information about the parent and the step parent on the FAFSA. And if the student's parent is widowed, they'll just provide information about that surviving parent. Students with undocumented parents who are considered dependent students uh, should still provide parental financial information. The parents will uh, provide all zeros for the social security number, and they'll provide income earned from work instead of tax information. So we have moved along now and we are at the parent demographic section of the FAFSA. And so uh, the student's parents will provide basic demographic information here. And I do want to point out a few things. Kathy, the parents can we will be, stop it yes. and answer a few questions before we move on to the parent info? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. A few came in. Um, so the first question is from um, the last question on housing. So going back a few slides, is it mm -hmm. better to say that you're going to live in the dorms even if you're unsure? Is that going to impact your financial aid? So it will impact the cost of attendance. Uh, if you decide not to live in the dorms, the financial aid office will adjust your cost of attendance. So I would answer to the best of your ability what you intend right now. You can always change your mind and the financial aid office will adjust your cost of attendance uh, based on that change. Perfect. And one thing to keep in mind um, with living on campus versus off is that especially in North Dakota, a lot of colleges have one year residency requirements. So if you're a high school senior going into your freshman year of college, even like the only time you're ever able to live um, off campus is if you're going to school in the town in which you live. So like, for example, if you're from Bismarck and going to Bismarck State or you marry, you would be able to live at home. But other than that, typically you're required to live on campus your freshman year. Um, so second question is a follow-up question on selective service. So mm -hmm. um, the attendees uh, student is seven, it, their son is 17 and they assume that they'll indicate no, he hasn't registered because he's 17, but he'll be 18 in February. So how do they answer that question? So my recommendation is that you, of course, answer no, you've not registered. And then I would go ahead and say no, uh, because you're not close enough. If you were to fill out the FAFSA right now, uh, you're not close enough to 18. I would wait and have them register separately on the Selective Service website. If the student were already 18 or it was within a 30 days, I would say yes, have the FAFSA register me. but since the student is 17 right now, I would wait and do that independent of the FAFSA. Okay, super. Um, and then the next question, um, I'm not really sure what they mean. How long does it take for a response also? Um, so I'm not sure if that's in regards to the award letter or Mm -hmm. what. Brady, if you could clarify that, that would be super. Um, so let's wait for Brady to clarify that question. Um, mm -hmm. Do participants have access to the PowerPoint. So we will upload a recording of this as well as the PowerPoint um, later this week. So it should be up by um, tomorrow end of business. So and then we'll send out an email about that. So the Final question that we have before we can move on so far, again if you have any questions go ahead and put them in the questions box, is what do, what do you do if your tax information doesn't come through? Um, how to get it to, I have put it in manually, but prefer to, um, but would prefer, I, I have put it in manually, but would prefer not to. So I that's in regards, uh, question in regards to the IRS data retrieval tool, and that might be mm. coming up in this next section. So yes, we'll be talking about the IRS data retrieval tool. And uh, while we're waiting for a response to that other question about um, when you should expect a response, in case that is about the award letter or the financial aid offer, usually that 
will come in the spring and sometimes schools will wait until they receive um, a college admissions application from the student as well. Yep, and actually a response did come in and that is what it was in regards to. Um, there are a couple colleges in North Dakota that do them early, but yes, um, typically, yeah, they wait until, until the spring um, for the most part. So, yeah. Okay. okay, perfect. I will mute and we can move on. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to point out a few questions on the parent demographic section. And one of those questions is whether or not the parents have lived in the state at least five years. And that question is on the FAFSA because some states have eligibility requirements and residency requirements uh, for their state financial aid programs. And also note household size and number in college. And we're going to talk about each of those separately. So how do you answer that household size question? The student will be included in the household. Also, the parent or parents will be included in the household number. You'll also include any other children other than the student, regardless of whether or not they live in the household, and any other people that might live in the household like a grandparent or another relative. However, I do wanna note here on the children, the other children and the other people in the family perhaps, or relatives or anyone else living in the household, they have to receive at least half of their support from the parents currently and will continue to do so in that 21-22 academic year. So just note that uh, as you answer that question. So who is included in the number in college? You will include the student, not the parents. So we have a lot of situations where parents are also attending post-secondary institutions, but you will not include the parents on the student's FAFSA. You'll include any others that are attending post-secondary education. Now note that that has to be an approved program and that program has to lead to a degree or certificate at a post-secondary school that's eligible to receive federal financial aid. And you'll not include any students um, that are attending military academies. So there is a lot of financial information needed for the FAFSA, and we list that out here on the screen, but it is a lot easier to use the IRS data retrieval tool. And to use that data retrieval tool, you must have a valid social security number. You must have filed your 2019 federal tax return. Now, there was an extension this year because of the pandemic. You had until July 15th to complete your 2019 federal taxes. And we know the extension is next week. The deadline for extensions is October 15th. But hopefully you have filed your tax return and can use the data retrieval tool. In addition, you cannot have changed your marital status since the last calendar year. And in this case, it's December 31st, 2019. The reason for that is they want the information to be as accurate as possible on the FAFSA. And it's also an IRS security feature. So to use the IRS data retrieval tool, you must indicate that you have already filed your 2019 taxes. And then you're going to click on link to the IRS. You're going to be asked to enter your FSA ID username and password. And again, you're going to link over to the IRS website because you're actually leaving the FAFSA and going over to the IRS. Once you arrive at the IRS website, you'll get a warning message that basically says, you are who you say you are and that you're gonna use this for the intended purposes. You'll okay that screen and then you're going to enter some tax return filing information and your address information. 
I want to mention here, it's important to have your 2019 tax return in front of you when you complete this form because it has to match exactly what you have on your 2019 tax return. If you spelled out street on your 2019 tax return, you need to spell it out here. If there is not an exact match, the IRS will not match the information and you won't be able to use the data retrieval tool. If you do have a match, you'll see a screen like this and you'll have the option to change your mind if you don't want to transfer the information back. But of course, you'll want to hit transfer now and then you're going to be returned back to the FAFSA. You won't see the information that the IRS provides on uh, the FAFSA. You will only see transferred from the IRS. One of the nice things this year about the IRS data retrieval tool is you won't have to answer this schedule one question. Uh, the IRS data retrieval tool will do that automatically for you. But if you're completing the FAFSA financial information uh, manually, you will have to answer schedule one questions. And so note here that you're gonna answer no if you didn't file a schedule one, but you're also going to answer no if you filed a Schedule I for those reasons that they list on the FAFSA. So uh, it can be a little bit confusing, but just remember they're trying to take out income that shouldn't apply or be counted on the FAFSA. Based on what they've seen so far on your financial information, they will ask you some additional financial questions. Uh, you see some of those here on the screen. And they're going to ask about untaxed income as well. And so we list out the different types of untaxed income here on the screen for you. A couple of types of untaxed income that I want to point out are any payments to tax deferred uh, 401ks or pension plans or savings plans. Uh, your employer may offer you a health savings account or a 401k, and you're taking out dollars from your paycheck pre-tax to contribute to that savings plan or that 401k. That's basically untaxed income, so you will need to include it on the FAFSA. However, don't include the match from the employer. Uh, and you won't include your 401k as an asset, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Some other common types of untaxed income include housing, food, or living allowances you might receive, uh, any veterans non-education benefits or child support received. You may receive some asset questions on the FAFSA. One of the questions you may get is whether or not your assets exceed a certain amount, and that amount differs for everyone completing the FAFSA. And you'll answer yes or no to that question. And then you may get asked about your assets. And that could include the balance in your cash, savings, and checking accounts. And what they want to know is the balance in those accounts the day you're completing the FAFSA. Not the day before or not the day after, the day you're filling out the FAFSA. They want to know about investments. Uh, that would include 529s or real estate. Maybe you have a rental property. And we'll talk about calculating the value of a rental property in just a moment. They'll also ask about current businesses or investment farms. However, uh, don't include the family farm and don't include any family business with 100 or fewer full-time employees. So I mentioned that they want to know about real estate investments and just a reminder that you won't include the family home as a real estate investment. But say you have a rental property and you rent that property out and it has a market value. 
if you have a rental house that may be worth $100,000, but you have a mortgage on that rental property, say $50,000, you're going to calculate the net values. So in this case, it would be $50,000, and that's what you'd include uh, as the value of that asset on the FAFSA. Based on what they've seen so far on the FAFSA, you may get some additional financial questions for the student. And also, if the student has filed a tax return for 2019, they'll be able to use the IRS data retrieval tool as well. So now we've moved along the FAFSA and we are at the very last tab to sign and submit it. The student has an opportunity to review the information that they've submitted and make any corrections if they need to. They'll be asked to read a statement that indicates that everything they've provided on the FAFSA is accurate and true to the best of their knowledge. And if they receive any federal funds, that they'll use it for the purposes intended. The student will sign the FAFSA with their FSA ID, username, and password. And the parent will also need to sign the FAFSA with their FSA ID, username, and password. Once the FAFSA is submitted, the student will receive a confirmation number. You see that here on the screen. They will also get a data release number. That data release number identifies the student's information on their FAFSA. So if a student decided to attend a post-secondary institution that they did not list on the FAFSA, they could use that data release number and contact the school financial aid office and let them know that number and the school can then pull down the student's information to calculate an award letter. As you go through the FAFSA, there are a number of help options available for you. You see those listed here on the screen. I do wanna point out the Federal Student Aid Information Center 800 number, as well as Mapping Your Futures 800 number. I mentioned the student aid report earlier, and this is what a student aid report will look like. You're only seeing the very top of it though. It can be several pages long. The student should review that student aid report and make sure everything is accurate. And the student can go into the FAFSA and make any corrections if anything is wrong on the student aid report. Note in the upper right-hand corner that data release number that we talked about, and below it is the expected family contribution. And that could be any dollar amount, it could be zero, or some other amount. And so we're gonna talk about the expected family contribution. The expected family contribution is the amount that the Department of Education says a family can reasonably be expected to contribute to that student's education. They calculate it using data from the FAFSA and a federal formula. It stays the same regardless of college that the student plans on attending. And they look at two components. They look at what they think the parent can contribute, but also what the student can contribute to their education. So I wanted to give you an idea of how a school calculates a financial aid award. As we mentioned earlier, the school will calculate a cost of attendance for each student. And that cost of attendance not only includes tuition and fees, it may also include books, equipment, living expenses, and transportation. After they calculate that cost of attendance for the student, they're gonna subtract that expected family contribution and they'll come up with the student's financial need. And based on that financial need, they will award grants, scholarships, or loans to the student. Now, not always are they able to meet all of the student's financial need. 
And so the student may have unmet financial need and they may have to look at seeking additional scholarships or at other types of loan programs in order to meet all of their financial need. I wanted to give you an idea of what a financial aid award could be for a first year student. And you see the amount there for the federal Pell Grant. That is the amount for this academic year. Uh, they determine that amount every year, so it could be a different amount in the 21-22 academic year. The federal Pell Grant is a need-based program, so a student will have to have financial need to be awarded a Pell Grant. And it could be any amount, um, it could be lower than that maximum amount. The student could also receive a direct loan of $5,500. Now, if the student has financial need, up to $3,500 of that direct loan could be subsidized. And what we mean by that is that the federal government will pay the interest on the student loan while the student is in school. Uh, student loans start accruing interest and that interest does capitalize, so it is quite a savings for the student. In fact, I even recommend students who don't receive subsidized student loans that if they can, go ahead and pay the interest on those student loans while they're in school because it will mean that much less that they have to repay after they graduate uh, from college. The interest rates are fantastic this year on federal student loans, 2.75% for undergrad students. Now, we don't know what it will be for the 21-22 academic year. That rate is set usually towards the end of May, 1st of June, prior to the academic year. I do encourage students uh, to make sure that they borrow wisely and only borrow what they need to pursue their post-secondary education. And also look at any free sources of financial aid, uh, that gift aid that does not have to be repaid first be before considering a direct loan. In addition, parents can borrow up to the cost of attendance minus any financial aid that the student receives. And the current interest rate on parent loans is 5.3%. This is an example of what a financial aid offer or financial um, aid award letter would look like. Note that the award letters or financial aid offers are different from different schools and so be very careful when you're looking at the award letter or financial aid offer, offer and make sure you understand what are student loans and what are grants and scholarships. Also, if you receive grants and scholarships, make sure you understand any requirements of those grants and scholarships before you sign the award letter and return it. And note the cost of attendance on the award letter as well, especially if you're comparing different colleges, different college and university award letters. I do think it's very important that students seek scholarships as much as possible. And I sometimes hear them say it is a lot of work, which I will agree, it is a lot of work to apply for scholarships. However, it is time well spent, in my opinion. I remind students that if they spend 10 hours working on scholarship applications and they win just one $1,000 scholarship, that's like earning $100 an hour. So in my opinion, it's uh, very much, um, uh, very well worth it for the student to apply for scholarships. So in applying for scholarships, it's important that the student develop a plan. They understand the cost of attendance at the institution they plan to attend, uh, and they can use that to help establish a scholarship goal. When they're looking for different scholarships, they should look local, they should look at the college they're planning on attending, look at employers 
sometimes employers of students or their parents' employers. I know I received a scholarship for one of my daughters uh, to pursue uh, her education. Also look at any organizations or employers that align with your career interest. And of course, there are the scholarship search engines out there and we'll list a few of those in just a moment. When the student's writing the essay, uh, they should have somebody else review it. Make sure the form has no mistakes and make sure they have no mistakes in their essay. Also keep organized. Uh, we have a scholarship tracking sheet and I'll provide a link to that tracking sheet in just a moment. Make sure you know all of the deadlines and the requirements. And finally, have a dedicated email address. And the reason we recommend this is that if you register that email with the scholarship search engines online and they send you notices when a scholarship matches your profile, it's easier to notice those emails uh, if you have a dedicated email. In addition, if you register for those search engines and you start getting marketing emails, it's going to keep those marketing emails out of your other inbox. So Mapping Your Future is available to answer your questions. Uh, we have that 1-800 number you see on the screen. Also our email, feedback at mappingyourfuture.org. And now I'd like to see if there are any other questions for us tonight. All right, so we do have a couple questions. So everyone who is uh, out there still listening, last call for questions. So the first question is about taxable income and how it's counted. So if a student had a disabled parent and that disability income isn't counted on taxes, is it counted on the FAFSA application? So social uh, security disability income is not counted on the FAFSA. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, and then um, the next question is about federal, or is about the Parent PLUS loan. So mm -hmm. do parents have to take that Parent PLUS loan or can they look at other options? They are not required to take out loans at all, and they have uh, the ability to do uh, look at other options if they want to. It is not something that is required. Okay, super, thank you. And then on the scholarship front, um, just a reminder out there for all of our North Dakota attendees, North Dakota Dollars for Scholars is a statewide scholarship organization um, that you can apply at any time. Well, you can start your profile at any time, but scholarships open January 1st. So NorthDakota.DollarsForScholars.org is available to all North Dakota high school students and current college students, as long as you graduated from a North Dakota high school. Um, so we are not seeing other questions. However, I had a question um, mm -hmm. that I'd like you to address just because I've had so many people ask me about it um, lately. So it's in regards to um, the using tax tax taxes from 2019. Obviously, mm -hmm. a lot has happened uh, since yes. 2019. So what mm -hmm. should families do who are filing the FAFSA this year with their 2019 taxes who were impacted um, in 2020 here by job loss or income reduction or, you know, just all, all of the things that, you know, COVID has brought on this year? Mm -hmm. That's a very common situation. The parent will still need to provide 2019 tax information on the FAFSA. However, after they submit that information, I recommend they reach out to the colleges or universities they've listed on the FAFSA and let them know that they have a special circumstance. Uh, often the colleges and universities will have a process for filing a financial aid appeal or a financial aid review. Uh, it's very important that they let them know their status has changed from 2019 and it could impact their ability to pay for an education. 
Perfect. And then the final question that we have is, is the FAFSA something that you can fill out every year as a college student? And I like that um, they phrased it as, can I fill it out instead of, <laughs> instead of do I have to? <laughs> So if you want to remain eligible for federal financial aid and other financial aid programs, yes, you will need to fill it out every year. And the nice thing about it is it is um, a renewal FAFSA, so they save some of your information. So it's a lot easier uh, to fill it out uh, in the years following the initial year that you complete the FAFSA. Wonderful. And that was the last question that we had for this evening. So we will wrap it up. So thanks everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Kathy, for being our presenter this evening. It was very comprehensive and we, you know, we're during our other financial aid webinar, we're not able to touch on the form as in depth. So we really appreciate your expertise. Well, um, thank you. Yeah. Next week, we have two career discovery webinars. Um, our next one is on Wednesday, October 14th at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, and that will be a panel on the tribal colleges in North Dakota. We have five tribal colleges in the state, so attendees will learn about what sets tribal colleges apart and what unique services they offer, and they're located all throughout the state. There's five of them. And also next week, on Thursday, October 15th at at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, we will be hosting an entrepreneur panel featuring several North Dakota entrepreneurs. Um, during this session, students will learn what it takes to start your own their own business and become their own boss, and that not all paths to success look quite the same. Um, so you can go and register for this and all career discovery webinars on the career discovery tab on the Career Compass website. So that's careercompass.nd.gov. All right. Thanks so much, everyone, and we will see you next week. Bye.